Hi, Dr. H here. This lesson is going to go over cellular transport, the way that things get in and out of cells. I remember from an earlier lesson, the main controlling structure in the cell for what gets in and out is the cell membrane. Uh, I'm not going to go over the structure of the cell membrane in this lesson. Uh, you can find that other places. Uh, but just to remind you, it is made up mainly of a phospholipid bilayer, seen here in kind of uh, this red and yellow uh, pieces here, and there are lots of proteins associated with the membrane as well. And those are all different types here shown in blue. Before we get into how uh, things get through this membrane, we need to just go over some real quick definitions uh, that we'll be referring back to. Uh, the first few you should certainly be kind of familiar with, uh, sol solute, solvent, the ones that are probably most important that we will be referring to back quite a bit are the last two here, concentration and gradient. So concentration, very simply, it's how much stuff, how much solvent is found in the solution. And the other one, gradient, uh, refers to a difference, uh, usually in the concentration, but as it says here, uh, can be anything, the temperature, pressure, charge, uh, it's basically any kind of difference between two areas. And we, we put those together, we we'll talk a lot about the concentration gradient uh, when we talk about cellular transport. When you set up, when there is a concentration gradient set up, uh, what normally happens is something called diffusion, uh, where molecules tend to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We can model this by looking at a drop of food coloring into water. So the food coloring drops in, it starts out as a really thick concentrated drop and then slowly spreads out through the whole water. That's kind of modeled here in, in the picture. So we can think of this as molecules tend to move down the concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So they go from high to low, kind of down this concentration gradient hill. It's very useful to think of concentration gradients as hills. And we'll come to some examples of that in a little, little bit later where it's very useful. So how do things get across a membrane? Well, first of all, you should remember that the membrane is selectively permeable, meaning that some things can get through quite easily, some things not so much, some things can't get through at all. And when we talk about movement across a membrane, there's two major types that we can divide this into. And that is passive transport, uh, passive meaning that it does not require any energy input from the cell, and then there's uh, active transport, which as the name active implies, this does require energy input. So first, we'll go over the few different types of passive transport. And the first uh, is what we call just very simple diffusion. And this uh, occurs when molecules are able to just move right in between the molecules of the cellular membrane. They're able to move between the, the phospholip, as you see here by this red arrow. Uh, so what type of molecules can do this? Uh, basically, they are lipid soluble molecules, um, some vitamins, these, a lot of the fat soluble vitamins can do this, uh, vitamins A and D for example, uh, and some very small molecules such as dissolved gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide are able to just move right in between. Uh, this figure that I pulled actually said that water uh, is able to move through by simple diffusion but that is obviously incorrect as water is about the most lipid insoluble molecule around. Okay, water does not move through the membrane through simple diffusion. Okay, so very small molecules, uh, lipid soluble molecules, and definitely uncharged molecules. Okay, ions very, are, are very small, uh, but they are certainly not lipid soluble and they're not going to be able to move in between the membrane molecules like this. So what happens if you do need to move uh, larger molecules or water soluble molecules through. Uh, that The cell has a method called facilitated diffusion to do that. Um, and 
facilitated just simply means uh, helped. So there are proteins embedded in the membrane that allow these molecules to move through. Uh, in this case, this is what we call a channel protein because it basically just forms a hole within the membrane and these molecules, looks like these little hexagonal green guys, are able to move through. And this is, this is passive transport. Okay, the cell is not putting out any energy to do this and these molecules are moving down the concentration gradient from an area of high concentration on this side to an area of lower concentration over here. So things that move this way, uh, water soluble molecules, okay, remember the inside of the cell membrane here with the uh, phospholipid tails is very hydrophobic. So water soluble things are not gonna wanna be in there. So this channel protein of, is like a little safe place for them to go through. Uh, some examples, ions. I mentioned ions can't get, are charged, so they can't get through between there, but they can move through these channel proteins. Amino acids and sugars are a little bit too big to fit between the molecules, but they can get through these channel proteins. There's also one other type of facilitated diffusion, on that, and it differs just in the type of protein that it uses. And in this case, there's some, what's called a carrier protein. And in this case, we're moving through these little, I don't know what color that is, kind of seafoam green, uh, oblong, oval, oval uh, shaped molecules. And they're coming in through this, what's called a carrier protein. So this carrier protein, again, goes all the way through the membrane, but it kind of sits like this, open to the outside. And then when a molecule binds in the middle, it kind of flips open and the molecule can move into the cell or out of the cell. They can work both ways. But again, this is a form of passive transport. The cell is not putting in any energy to change the shape of, of this molecule here, of this uh, carrier protein. So that means that things are moving down the gradient. Okay, high concentration on this side, low concentration down here, and that is the direction that the molecule will be moving. Okay, so passive transport, simple diffusion, the very small uncharged molecules, lipid soluble molecules can move right in between the phospholipid molecules of the membrane. Facilitated diffusion, uh, some molecules require a transport protein, whether that is a channel or a carrier protein, just kind of helps them get through the membrane. And those are water soluble molecules or larger molecules. There is one other kind of specialized form of passive transport that always seems to, for some reason, confuse uh, students, and that is osmosis. Osmosis just is very simply just the diffusion of water. Okay, when you set up a concentration gradient of water. Okay, so if you look at this setup here, so this is what's called a U-tube. It is a glass tube shaped like a U. And in the middle here, we have a membrane. On one side, we have water with a certain amount of solute in it. And on the other side, we have water, a solution with a lower concentration of that solute. Now, we are uh, going to imagine that this membrane is impermeable to that solute. So the salt can't move through. Normally, we would say, OK, a lot of salt over here, not so much salt over here the salt's going to want to move that way from high to low, but it can't do that. Water, however, can move through this. So where is the concentration of water higher? The water concentration is higher on this side. There's more water, you can think of, on this side than there is on this side. So water will tend to move this way. Okay, And we can see that over here, this is the final state where the level of the water is lower. So more water moved over here, and now we are moving towards equilibrium, okay, where the concentration is uh, becoming equal on both sides. So then related to this uh, movement of water, this osmosis, are these three terms down here, isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. It's very important that you uh, remember and understand what these three terms mean. And if you just under kind of look at the prefix, you should be able to figure that out. Iso means the same. 
So if two solutions are isotonic, that means they have the same concentration. So at the end here, at equilibrium, things will tend towards, iso towards being isotonic. Hypotonic, hypo means less than or under. Uh, so a hypotonic solution has less solute than something else. You always have to have two solutions to compare here when using these terms. And then hypertonic uh, means the opposite. It means that a hypertonic solution has more dissolved solute. So what happens when we put cells into iso, hypo, or hypertonic uh, solutions? Uh, looking up here, the example in an animal cell, a red blood cell here, uh, animals like to be isotonic. Okay, Our blood plasma, the, the liquid part of our blood, is isotonic to the interior of the red blood cell. It has the exact same uh, solute concentration. So that means it is at equilibrium. Okay, Water flows in, same amount of water flows out. Everybody's happy. Red blood cells have their characteristic kind of dimpled shape. If you put this into a hypertonic state, say you drink a gallon of seawater for some reason, uh, then the blood plasma becomes filled with salt. Okay, now the salt concentration is higher outside. The water concentration is higher inside the cell. So water tends to move out of the cell to become isotonic, to reach equilibrium. And the cells tend to shrivel up. Okay, and that's obviously very bad. The opposite of that is hypotonic. If, there, if now the blood plasma concentration uh, is lower in dissolved solutes than inside the red blood cells. In this case, water will tend to move into the red blood cells. Remember, it's always passive transport. It's always going to be moving from high to low. And in this case, uh, the red blood cells will swell uh, and can actually end up bursting. You can see one kind of bursting right there. Uh, and that is also obviously a very bad situation. That can come if you are drinking uh, massive amounts of water, of uh, just plain water. You can actually shift yourself over to a hypotonic state. Uh, plants, on the other hand, like to be in a hypotonic state. Okay, they want to have, they want to be a little bit out of equilibrium, and have water constantly moving in to the cell and it's placed into the large central vacuole and that central vacuole swells up and puts pressure on the cell walls and that pressure is what's called turgor pressure and this is what holds plants up especially green leafy plants okay, if you've gone away for the weekend forget to water your plants you come home they're all wilted uh, that's because they have lost a lot of water and that state is over here uh, that's called flaccid Okay, when water moves out a little bit, the cell wilts, it loses that turgor pressure. Okay, and you can get the plants back pretty quickly, just giving them a little bit of water. They'll usually perk right back up. However, if it gets really bad, okay, if you go away for a month and don't water your plants, or for some reason you water your plants with your salt water aquarium water, and they get hypertonic, that pulls all the water out of the, out of the cell, uh, the cell membrane actually begins to pull away from the cell wall, and that plant cell has now been plas plasmalized. It's gone through plasmolysis, and that cell is going to die. Okay, this is very, very bad for a plant. Okay, so plants like to be hypotonic with water moving in. Animal cells, red blood cells, prefer to be isotonic, where they are at equilibrium. Okay, so that's passive transport the cell not putting out any energy to move things in or out. What about active transport? When, when would this happen? So this happens when a cell needs to move something against the concentration gradient. It okay, needs to go from a low concentration to a high concentration. Okay, when a cell is constantly bringing in a certain substance, even though it already has lots of that substance inside and there's not that much outside, it still needs to gather up as much as it can. Okay, that's going against the gradient. Remember, we talked about using, uh, talking about the gradient as a hill. So now we're going from low to high. So we're pushing things up the hill, and that's obviously going to take some energy. Okay, and that energy, of course, is in the form of ATP. So the basic example 
of active transport uh, is what's called the sodium potassium pump. And this is a very important protein uh, in cell membranes. We'll come back, we'll see this again uh, when we talk about the nervous system. Uh, but basically, uh, sodium Na+, the sodium ions here, are pumped out of the membrane. Three sodium uh, ions are pumped out. And at the same time, two potassium ions, uh, positively charged ions, are pumped into the cell. We use this term pump uh, for these active transport proteins because they are using ATP. See the ATP molecule here, uh, phosphate being cleaved off. That releases the energy when the sodium moves out. And then it becomes ADP. The phosphate falls off. It opens back up, and the potassiums come in. Okay, so three sodiums get pumped out, so three positive charges go on the outside, two positive charges moves in, so that also sets up uh, a, a concentration gradient of charges, okay, it's more positive outside than, it, than inside, and again, that will become very important when we get back to the nervous system. Okay, so active transport, very simply something that is moving against the concentration gradient, going from low concentration to high concentration, and it uses these protein pumps. All active transport has to use this protein pump, and they always, of course, use ATP. Okay, so that's cellular transport.